It is truly a blessing that we can gather here together in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and open our hearts and worship our Lord God Almighty. There are announcements in the bulletin I would like to draw your attention to. There will be Wednesday night supper, not this week, but next week, because by then, should have the air conditioners installed and finished. There is one up and running, which is great, and it appears to be doing well. I know this is not really the work of the kingdom, but it does feel nice when we have air conditioning, which, well, we haven't for a couple of weeks. <laughs> it's been a bit warm over in that side of the building, but we've managed. We do want to welcome our good friend Allison Hoffman with us today on violin. Always a joy to have you with us. Um, and there's one other announcement, uh, and that is Mickey would start we're sending a card around, um, and if you don't get to it today, that's fine. I'll have it next week. And this is just a, a card for our DCE, Michael Schulte, who's away this summer uh, doing his CPE, Clinical Pastoral Education Training in St. Louis, which I imagine is tough. So in the middle of his time away from us, I thought we would just send him a card and tell him we miss him. So uh, it's going to start up here, and we'll like I say, if it doesn't make its way around to you, it will do this again next week. And I hope he's not listening. That would ruin the surprise. If there are no other announcements, I invite you to stand and let us worship God together. Please stand. The Lord answers you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protects you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. I know that the Lord will help his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with mighty victories by his right hand. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses. But our pride is in the name of the Lord, our God. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call.
We long to live as the people of God, as God's people. But yet in the very depths of our lives, we know how much we have hurt some of those around us through our words, through our actions, as well as from our indifference. But God hears us when we call. God sees into our hearts. God answers with the grace that we need. So let us now pray together and confess our sins before God and ask for God's glorious forgiveness. Let us pray. God of the heart, we confess that we are superficial and too easily drawn to the trivial. We readily applaud the shallow cosmetic qualities that we find in ourselves and in others. Forgive us our sins and make us new. Open our eyes that we may review ourselves as you see us. Help us cultivate hearts that are worthy of you. Amen. Our assurance of pardon. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Jesus Christ is truly our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, and so much more. In all we do, let us remember his holy name. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please be seated. Um, before we come to our prayer for illumination and the scripture reading, I want to take a moment and introduce what is going to be a sermon series that will take us through the months of July and August. This sermon series I've entitled The Shepherd King, and in it we will look at and enjoy the wonderful stories of King David that we find in the books of First and Second Samuel. And we know all the stories. I mean, today's the anointing of David, next week is well, Goliath, because that's the best one. Um, Bathsheba figures in, and all others, stories that we know. But through these, we'll be asking the question, what does it mean to be a king? And what does it mean to be God's king? And how does that reflect on our lives? And through this, I've also had the joy of picking out some wonderful hymns. And each week, you know, make a Take a moment and try to figure out how that hymn plays in to the scripture reading and the story for the day. For example, we opened with the God of Abraham, Abraham praise. You can't tell the story of David without going back to Abraham because it's all, well, it's all part of the great covenant that God made. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. I really shouldn't say any more. So. I invite you now to join with me in our prayer for illumination. Let us pray together. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our reading today is from the book of 1 Samuel, beginning with uh, chapter 15, verse 34. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gebeah of Saul. 
Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was very sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, I take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab, that was Jesse's oldest son, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look upon his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, that was his second son, and made him pass before Samuel. And Samuel said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And Samuel said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Jesse said, Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And Jesse said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Jesse sent and brought him in. Now, he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him for this is the one. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord.
I'd like to ask the children to come forward, please. I need all of you. I need Max, too. You'll see. Come on. Okay, you're not supposed to run in church, I know, but lollygagging is not the... Max, I'm going to need you on the front row, please. And you're not a kid, but you'll see why. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. All right. Let's see. Let's imagine we're going to uh, pick a team captain for, oh, basketball. Shh. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Come on. Stand up. You're the tall. I need you to stand up. Now, dun, dun. Oh, you, you two need to switch places here. We're going by height. That's right. For basketball, because it's important in basketball to be the tallest, right? Stop, stop, stop. And so if I were to pick the team captain, the person who's going to be in charge of this team, hmm, which one am I going to pick? Him? Why are you pointing? No, you're reading ahead. We're going to pick the big guy, the tall guy. Yes. Who's also the oldest? You are. So you're, but what if we pick him? Look at that little guy down there. Can he play basketball? No. no. He might be really good at it. Who knows? Okay. So you can sit down. You can go back if you want. I just needed, there you go. <laughs> Come on in there, Jim. Yes. I'm good. <laughs> so read a story a moment ago about um, David. Who's David? Do we know who David is? Bible, Old Testament David, King David, David and Goliath. Yeah, that David. Yes. Well, the story is pretty complicated, so I'm going to try to boil it down to um, God wasn't pleased with the king of Israel. And God said, I need a new king. And so he selects Samuel, his prophet, to go to Bethlehem and find a man named Jesse. And Jesse's got a whole bunch of sons, eight sons. And God says, the new king is, gonna, is, is one of Jesse's sons. Go down there and I'll tell you which one it is. So, I mean, this is a big thing. I mean, to be the next king of Israel, this is huge. So Samuel goes down and he has Jesse, he says, I want you to bring in your sons. And so Jesse brings in the oldest first, because he's also very tall and uh, he's strong. And, you know, if you're going to pick a king, he's the one that looks like a king. Even Samuel went, ooh, this guy's impressive. And God said, what do you think God said? nope, not that one. And so they brought in the second one. And God went, nope. And the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one, and the sixth one, and the seventh one. And God said no to all of them. And Samuel's confused because, like, I thought we we're picking one of these sons. And so we asked Jesse, have you got any more sons? And Jesse goes, yeah, yeah, there's another one. He's, he's the little one the youngest. He's not even here. We didn't think he was important. And Samuel said, well, bring him in. And they brought him in and it was, what was his name? David. David. Yeah, it was David. David was just a shepherd. He was out. He had a job to do. He was taking care of the sheep. Um, you know, it's like your parents leaving you home to make sure the dog gets fed. That's, you know, you don't get to come with us. You stay home. You're not they left David because David wasn't important. But God looked at David and not at how tall he was or how strong he was or anything else or how old he was. Looked at his heart and said, this is the one that's going to be king of Israel. Now, not tomorrow. It would take years before David would become king. But God chose the one that nobody else would have chosen. Even his family went, ah, David, no way. And David turned out to be one of the great 
kings of Israel. Even though he lived a thousand years before Jesus, and Jesus lived 2,000 years before us, and that's like 1,000 plus 2,000 is him. 3,000, you are a genius. 3,000 years ago, and yet we still look back and go, David was one of the great kings. Why? Because God looked at his heart. So, if anybody tells you you can't do something because you're not tall enough or strong enough or fast enough, you go, you don't know that. I might be better than you think. I might have secrets inside of me that only God knows about. So, don't let anybody tell you, A, that you can't do something, unless it's your parents and they mean it. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, but also, remember that God sees things in you. God knows who you are that other people can't see. And that's really nice to know that somebody like God knows who we are. Let's pray. Almighty God, we are thankful that you can see into us and you know how special we are. Because indeed, you made us and we are your children. And all the children of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Max. To begin this sermon series, it would be most helpful if we undertake a very quick review of the history of Israel. So, strap in, here we go. In the beginning, God issued a call to Abraham and Sarah to become God's people. They complied. They had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. And then through this series of rather bizarre events, which included Jacob's sons selling their brother Joseph into slavery, the Jacob family relocates to Egypt, where they prosper and multiply. And over time, their presence in that land becomes a threat to the Egyptians, who begin to fear these people who are known as the Hebrews. So... The Egyptians then enslave the Hebrews for 400 years and force them to work on the great public construction projects in that country. But as the years go by, the Hebrews cry out in distress. But they weren't crying to God specifically because while in Egypt, it seems they had largely forgotten the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But nonetheless, God hears their cries. And because of that covenant established with Abraham, God responds. And God then selects a very reluctant Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, across the wilderness, and into a land that they may call their own, a land that would become known as Israel. Once settled in Israel, these people regard God as their sovereign. The Israelites at the time were organized into a structure that political scientists today would describe as a loose confederation of tribes, just people living together. They had no formal monarch. They did, however, have this network of regional administrators known as judges, and there also were prophets who arose as needed to speak the word of God to the people. This theopolitical arrangement continued for many generations until the time came that the people desired 
something different. Uh, they wanted a change. They wanted to be like their neighbors. They looked around at the countries around them, and those countries had kings, real human flesh and blood kings that were leading them. And the people of Israel, that's what they wanted. So they take their wish before the prophet Samuel, and Samuel reluctantly agrees to go to God. And God is distressed now because the people are rejecting him as their king. God also warns that the people won't like the demands that a king will make on them, taking their sons off to war and putting their daughters to work and taking their crops to pay for all of this. But God relents and grants the people a king. And the people also demand that this first king not just be anyone, that, but that it be a man named Saul. Now, Saul is strong and tall and good-looking, and he comes from a wealthy family. He is also an accomplished warrior, and he is the sort of man who really should be king. If you were lining people up to choose a king, Saul is the obvious choice. So God tells Samuel to anoint Saul as king of Israel. And it's important to remember that Saul was anointed because this will come back in the later stories. Saul becomes king and he is well, he was a successful warrior, and he continues that. He is successful in curtailing the military threat posed by the Philistines. You remember there was war after war with the Philistine neighbors. However, somewhere along the line, Saul disobeys a very specific command given by God, and God therefore loses favor with Saul. And as we find in our reading for today, the Lord is sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. So then the Lord instructs Samuel, now the prophet, to travel down to Bethlehem, and there Samuel will find this man named Jesse, and Saul is to anoint one of the sons of Jesse. As God explains in our reading, for I have provided for myself, a king among Jesse's sons. Now, Samuel is understandably concerned because what God is telling him to do could be interpreted as treason. Because Samuel's worried that if Saul catches wind of this plan to anoint a new king, that Saul would have him killed. So God, God proposes this pretense. God tells Samuel, uh, take a heifer with you and just explain to anybody that asks that you're planning a sacrifice. I mean, after all, isn't that what prophets do? They, they sacrifice things. So Samuel travels down to Bethlehem with the heifer, of course, and he invites Jesse and his sons to a sacrifice and a feast. And at the event, Samuel observes Jesse's oldest son, Eliab, who himself was very tall and handsome. And Samuel presumes that, well, this must be the one that God wants to make king. I mean, look at the boy. He's perfect. He's also the firstborn. And we know the firstborn gets everything, but God speaks to Samuel and says, no, Eliab is not the one. Don't look at his appearance or his height. The Lord does not see as mortals see. Mortals look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So evidently, whatever was in Eliab's heart was not what God was searching for in this particular king. So Samuel instructs Jesse to bring him his second son, Abinadab. 
and then his third, Shammah, and then the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. And God gives them all the thumbs down. At this point, Samuel's confused. God had told him that he would anoint a son of Jesse, and there don't appear to be any more sons left. So he inquires of Jesse if by chance, you know, do you have any more sons? I mean, he's got seven here. Odds are that there's another one that he's just misplaced somewhere. And Jesse replies, yeah, 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 there's another one. Uh, he's the youngest and he's out tending the sheep. Well, for God's sake, says Samuel, get him here now. So Jesse sends for the youngest of his sons, the one named David. And when David arrives, Samuel sees that he has a red or ruddy complexion. He has beautiful eyes and he to himself is handsome. So God speaks to Samuel and says, this is the one. Go and anoint him. And so Samuel anoints the young David with the oil that he's brought with him. And we read here, the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And that is the account of David's anointing, how he went from shepherd boy to become the future king of Israel. And as I said, it would be many years be before he would become the actual king because Saul continues to be king. But this story raises a question of what exactly is a king and what is the function of a king. And by king, I mean any leader, a king or a queen, a governor, a senator, a councilman, a PTO president. The first thing that we learn from this story is that David is not a king for the people. David is a king for God, and that makes everything different. Remember the words that God said to Samuel at the beginning, I have provided for myself a king. Why would God need a king? Well, we know. We know that God loves his people and God cares for his people. And so it makes sense that God would also prefer a leader of his people that feels the same way. Someone who also would love and care for them. The king is to be an extension of God. And the person that God chooses is not necessarily the ones that we humans would select because God doesn't look at outward appearances. God looks at the heart. We, on the other hand, in our sinfulness, have a tendency to favor the superficial and ignore the depths of the soul. Logically, in the story, the one who should have been chosen was Eliab, who is the firstborn, because the firstborn, they come first. But time and again through Scripture, God shows us that it's the ones that we least expect that are the ones chosen. God is more than willing to break the norm. When Samuel asked Jesse if he has any more sons out there, Jesse replies that, yeah, there remains the youngest. And it's interesting because in Hebrew, the word youngest implies being short or small. It's like we might call the youngest child peewee or shrimp. And in this beauty pageant of height, David didn't stand a chance against his older brothers. And you go back and remember the story of choosing Saul as king, one of the reasons he was chosen was that he was tall of stature. God's choice here is less than obvious for us. Now, this story of David in chapter 15 is only the beginning of the David story. And through this sermon series, we will explore the qualities that God recognized in David's heart even when he was young. 
qualities such as kindness and compassion and care. Even at the end of Saul's life, David would not seek retribution against Saul, who had harmed him so much. But most importantly, the quality that David possessed was that David listened to God. David was willing to be directed by God. David kept God foremost in his heart most of the time. We'll get to that story too. David was truly like a shepherd watching over his sheep. And he was the kind of king, the kind of leader, the kind of person who was most pleasing to God. When Samuel instructed Jesse to assemble his sons, you know, they didn't even think to include David. I mean, why should they? What possible reason would the prophet have with the youngest, smallest, least significant of the brothers? Because David, in their eyes, was inconsequential. He wasn't even on their radar. But God saw differently. God had a task for David to be king, and God Pour God's spirit upon David. Now, this pouring out of spirit, that's really not something that we see very often in Scripture. It's fairly rare until we come to that particular celebration of Pentecost, a thousand years after David. That day when God's spirit flooded the house where the followers of Jesus are gathered. And as a result, they surge out into the street and into the world, ordained with the task of proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Christ, the message that salvation is at hand. And we, we as followers of Christ, we ourselves share in that Holy Spirit. We ourselves have been tasked by God to share the good news in many and unique ways. It may be telling the good news through preaching or by enacting the good news by works of compassion and love and caring and sacrifice, giving of ourselves to help others. That is the gospel of Christ. The story of David, it's not 3,000 years old and in the past. The story of David applies to all of us. It reminds us that God sees into our hearts and has filled us with God's spirit so that we may go out into the world sharing the message of God's love. We may not be queens or kings or presidents or czars or anything like that. But we can be called by God to be leaders in our own way, even for the smallest of tasks. Whatever our calling may be, we should perform it as if we have been anointed by Samuel himself, because we have. And I believe that each of us has been tasked by God in some way for some purpose. It may be grand, it may be small. But look into your heart and find your task and do it. You have the Spirit. You have been anointed. Amen. I invite you now to join with me as together we confess what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us stand and confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Holy God, we ask that you will help us remember and discover those seeds of love, hope, grace, and peace, which we carry in our hearts and in our souls, as well as in our wallets and our purses, so that in remembering, we might offer them to you, our God, for use in the work of reconciliation and hope in our world. May what we give, whether it's our time, our talents, or our money, be given in the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. be seated. Let us offer our hearts to God in prayer. Let us pray. Shepherd God, we are your flock. What a gift and a challenge that is. For a flock can be everything. It can be strong. It might be slow. It can be caring. It might be anxious or needy. It can be giving. It can be all this and more with room to spare. The flock follows the shepherd, not knowing where they might end up. But they know that wherever it is, they will be kept safe. The flock trusts the shepherd, and we trust you. When we cry, you hear our pain. When you when we sing, you rejoice with us. We stand in awe watching you, watching over us. And we feel secure and we feel loved. Thank you, Lord. And as you love us, help us to show this love to others. Help us to care, to protect, to lead, to pray. Help us to be shepherds ourselves. As shepherds, we look out over this world this week, and we see so much that we cannot help but pray. We pray for the people of Cuba who have been experiencing some of the biggest anti-government protests in decades. They feel your, may they feel your presence in their exhaustion and rage and longing for the story of their lives to transform, to become one of freedom, equality, and justice. We pray for the people of Haiti, that they may feel your presence in the chaos over the recent assassination of their president. May the global community have wisdom in what help is truly needed. May the people of South Africa sense your steadying presence among the violent, deadly protests and riots and looting following the jailing of their former president. And we continue to offer prayers for our planet. 
And we pray for the communities that are suffering because of the selfish choices that are bringing an imbalance to the climate. We tremble as the western U.S. suffers under oppressive heat and fires. We pray for the Florida manatees dying of starvation in record numbers due to polluted waters killing off their food source. We pray for the people of Germany and Belgium suffering unbelievable flooding. And we continue to pray as COVID-19 rips across the landscape of our globe. We weep at the obvious healthcare disparities between nations and even within nations. We pray for vaccine access where needed, especially in nations such as Chad, Burkina Faso, and Papua New Guinea, and others. Holy Lord, we place our lives before you. Help us, mold us to be leaders that can bring change to this world. And may all that we do be a reflection of your holy will. Help us to be the shepherds of salvation. And as we live each moment, may we do so with the words of Christ on our lips, the words that he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both this day and forevermore. Amen.